Hello and welcome to another video of introductory statistics. In this video we're going to be doing confidence intervals. Confidence intervals for means and chapter 8 begins our confidence interval study and begins our study in inferential statistics. We talked about inferential statistics way back in chapter 1 and inferential statistics is where we use sample statistics, remember S goes with S, so sample statistics to estimate the P goes with P population parameter. Uh, so we're using the sample, the tiny sample, the subset of our data to estimate the bigger, larger population uh, the whole population. And that's what we're doing in this chapter, that we've made it to the heart and soul of the course. Um, this is a challenging chapter, though, as you will find out, uh, but it is rewarding, too, because we can take sample data and estimate for an entire population, which is really awesome. So for this session, be ready with your formula card calculator and lecture notes as always. And there is a fourth thing in this section too that we want to have handy and that is our tables. Um, so we have uh, T tables and you can see the picture of the T table right here. Uh, and you can find that under D2L content in the area of getting started. It should be listed right after your formula card. So you can go there and print that out and use that. And we'll use it not extensively. Newton likes to use it a little more than I like to use it, um, or a lot more, I should say, than I like to use it. But we will use this as a reference at the very least. And we may actually use it a couple of times to get some answers. Uh, so let's start by kind of reminding ourselves what we learned in the previous chapter, because this chapter will very heavily rely on all of the stuff that's come before it, particularly the sampling distribution of sample means that was the subject of chapter 7. Uh, and the normal distribution, as you see the picture here, is of this nice normal bell-shaped curve. Um, and we learned in chapter 7 the sampling distribution of sample means will be normal as long as we have a sample size of at least 30 data values or more. And so here, um, the sampling distribution is of x bar, so we have every possible x bar of a set size in the entire population, and that's what this distribution is, and it turns out that that is centered on the mean mu, and it has a standard deviation of sigma divided by the square root of n, as we learned about last time. So keep that in mind, and then 95% of the time, uh, our x bars would be in this light blue area, and that comes from the empirical rule uh, that we have 95% of the time our x bars will be in this area. 5% um, of the time, though, we will have our x bars out here, and that will become particularly useful as we talk about confidence intervals. Uh, so let's talk about what an interval means, and in order to define what an interval means, we really need to define what a single point estimate means. So a single point estimate would be a single data value, uh, and we can use x bar as our single data value. So x bar is our sample mean, and we use it to estimate the population mean mu. Um, in the section, the next section for proportions, um, we will talk a lot about the sample proportion um, that is p prime, and we will use it to estimate the population proportion of p. So this is a single point, a single proportion of our sample that estimates the proportion of our entire population. Uh, we don't do in this textbook, but some textbooks will try to um, use uh, S to estimate sigma to do confidence intervals for sigma. And in that way, S would be your single point estimate and sigma would be your uh, parameter that you're trying to estimate. Um, so all of these values are going to be point estimates, just one single number. Um, and uh, But what a confidence interval is, is a confidence interval is in a range of numbers. And so uh, here you would have an entire range of numbers that we would use to represent the confidence interval. And uh, with that in mind, let's suppose that we wanted to have a scenario um, and our sample mean happened to be 
and we said, okay, uh, we want to um, say that our population mean is exactly 9.36. Uh, we've surveyed 821 coronavirus patients um, to see how many days they were sick, and, and we averaged those 821, and we got 9.36. Now, how many U.S. adults are there um, who have had coronavirus? I guess that's going to be... Um, I don't know. I, I don't. There, there are a lot, several, several hundred thousand, but I don't actually know the answer. Has it been million? I don't know. Um, but certainly there are a lot of U.S. coronavirus patients. Way, 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 way more than the 821. And if we were to average all of those, how likely do you think we would get exactly 9.36? I think it's definitely going to be less than 1%. Um, percent. It's probably going to be less than, I don't know, one in a million chance. I mean, it's going to be just astronomically tiny. Um, so we have no confidence in our point estimate being accurate. But if we go a margin of error, we'll define that term later, to the left and a margin of error to the right, uh, we can be confident. So how can we be confident in you? Well, let's think about the empirical rule. The empirical rule says that we have 68% of our data values are within one standard deviation of the mean. So if we were to go one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right, we would contain 68% of our data. 68% um, though is not quite as confident as we'd usually like to be. 95% is much more confident than we'd like to be. We in the previous chapters, we've said 68% and 95%, uh, and that's still true if you only give two significant figures. But if you give four significant figures, um, then it's really 95.44%. Um, we'll go ahead and use negative 2 and 2 here, um, but really, if we were to get exactly 95%, um, it, we would have uh, 1.960, as we'll find out shortly. Uh, so going back to this example, if we start with our 9.36 days um, and then we add and subtract uh, two standard deviations, then what would that look like? Let's, uh, let's so we, we're going to start with 9.36 and we're going to, let's do the subtraction first. That gives us our lower limit. So as we subtract, we get our lower limit. So minus two times. Um, our standard deviation, we're going to estimate it with the 1.542, um, but remember we have to divide by the square root of n because we are using the sampling distribution instead of the population distribution. So when we do that, we'll get 9.25, not very different from 9.36, um, and uh, then when we change it to be plus, it will be um, 9.47. Um, so 9.25 to 9.47, and we can be 95.44% confident, according to our empirical rule, that this is correct. So that's awesome. So just by, by going out a little, a little less, and a little more, we have gained great confidence that our population mean is going to be somewhere between these two numbers. So this makes confidence intervals extremely powerful stuff um, so we don't we have no confidence exactly 9.36 but we have a ton of confidence in our interval and so the empirical rule has been very valuable to us we'll be a little more precise um, in when we compute uh, so the way that this works is we have our particular x bar of let's say 9.36 and how can we be sure I mean we're sure if we're in the center that we've got 95 percent of the data on either side but how can we be sure that we'll capture the mean um, well remember we're dealing with a sampling distribution so our 9.36 has a 95 percent chance of being in the light blue area and if you're in the light blue area and you go two standard deviations to the left and two standard deviations, well, this is the right, two standard deviations to the right and two standard deviations to the left, um, if you're in the light blue area, you're going to capture the mean mu. On the other hand, if you're in this dark blue area, you're not going to capture the mean mu. So what this is saying is that 95% of the time, our confidence intervals will be correct when they're estimating mu, but 5% of the time, we're going to be wrong.
And that's really what that 95% means, 95% confident, is that um, we're going to be right 95% of the time, but not 100% of the time. So some percent of the time we're going to be wrong, the complement of the 95%, if you will. And then uh, to go to what we did before, we took two times the standard error. And the reason we did two was because we knew that 95.44% of our data was within two standard deviations of the mean by the empirical rule. But we can actually compute that z-score. We're going to do that on the next slide um, if we want to find out more precisely what it will be. But we always take our z-score and multiply it by the standard error. And the standard error for means um, the standard error is just a, another way of saying the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So remember our standard deviation of the sampling distribution from chapter 7 was sigma divided by the square root of n. So everywhere here um, that you see SE or standard error, that's just referring to the standard deviation divided by the square root of n for means. Um, and the margin of error, so the margin of error is not to be computed, not the same thing as the standard error, it's a multiple of the standard error. Um, it's specifically the z-score multiplied by the standard error. Um, the margin of error is basically our entire room for error and using the point estimate to estimate our actual population. So, um, for instance, when we do proportions, uh, the room for error in using p prime to estimate p, when we do means, uh, the error that we can have in x bar when we use it to estimate mu. Uh, because essentially, we're going to start with our x bar, and we're going to go a margin of error to the left, and a margin of error to the right, and we're going to say this is going to contain the thing that we're trying to estimate, the population mean mu. Um, when we happen to have exactly 95%, it is 1.960. And the way that we know that that's true is Chapter 6 stuff. So Chapter 6 is definitely coming into play here. Um, aren't you glad you learned all that stuff now? Uh, so we can compute the z-score for any confidence interval. We put the confidence level in the very center of the curve and we say, okay, if we want a 95% confidence level, that's 95% in the center, that leaves 5% for both of the tails. Um, so uh, we have 5% or this tail um, plus this tail will be a total of 5%. Um, both of the tails are the same, so we divide by 2 and we get 2.5% on this tail and 2.5% on this tail. Um, and that, uh, that means that this area is uh, 2.5%. We actually can write this. So um, we can write this uh, z more specifically as the z-score um, subscript 0 0.025. Um, and it may seem strange that we're doing area to the right of our z, um, area to the right of our z as the subscript instead of um, area to the left because inverse norm always takes an area to the left. Uh, and that's that's true, unless you have one of the fancier calculators that you can specify. But when you do these subscripts, they are always area to the right. So keep that in mind. Um, and we'll talk more about the subscripts when we get to look at the tables, um, because they appear prominently on the tables. Um, so we can just figure this out, inverse norm is uh, to find area below the belt, and so area to the left is going to be 1 minus area to the right because the whole curve has an area of 1. And then z-scores always have a mean and a standard deviation of 0 and 1. So that's why we're using 0 and 1 here. So when we plug this into our calculator, the inverse norm will give us 1.960. If we were to do it for a 99% confidence interval and we plugged in, um, that would be 1% for both tails or half of a percent for a single tail. Um, so 1 minus 0 0.005 and we could write a subscript here of 0 0.005. Um, then that would give us 2.576. Um, so here, 1.960. Here, 2.576. So we'll have different z-scores for different percentages that way.
And then uh, we build our entire confidence interval, starting with the point estimate and adding a margin of error to the right and subtracting a margin of error to the left. Um, that gives us our lower limit and our upper limit of the confidence interval. Uh, and so if we're doing the confidence interval for means, we do point estimate plus or minus the z-score times our standard error. And our standard error for means looks like this. But what happens if we don't happen to know sigma? So we're using x bar, the whole point of the confidence interval is that we're, we're using x bar to estimate the population mean mu because we don't have the entire population's worth of data. If we had the entire population's worth of data, we wouldn't need to estimate mu. We would just average all the data values, use a computer program to average all the data values for us, and we wouldn't need to estimate it in the first place. So there'd be no point in doing this if we had the entire population's worth of data. So in real life, um, in Newton, half the time you will have sigma, but in real life you'd almost never know sigma or even a good estimate for sigma. Um, so in real life you wouldn't be able to use sigma. We use s instead, but s is only an approximation for sigma. It's not precise, so that means we don't have quite a 95% chance. As a matter of fact, the smaller our sample size is, the worse s the um, worse that s will be in estimating sigma. Um, so we have this little factor that we use. It's called a t-score instead of a z-score, and the t-score will be larger than our um, z-score, uh, so it's going to be more than our z, and it's going to kind of buffer us, give us a wider interval, slightly, not hugely, but slightly, depending on what the size of our sample is, because we won't have to be quite as big if we have a large sample size, because we'll, we'll be a lot more confident in s, the larger our sample size is. Um, and so our t-scores change depending on our sample size, and they um, kind of compensate for uh, the error that we know is going to be there and using s to estimate sigma. Uh, so there are really kind of two formulas for means um, depending on whether you know you're given the population standard. The only time you know is when you're told. Um, so if you were told explicitly this is the population standard deviation, not the sample standard deviation, but the population standard deviation, that's the only time you use the z-score. Um, else you use the t-score. And so uh, here, looking at the t-distribution, the light green and dark green are two different t-distributions for two different sample sizes. Um, the degrees of freedom, um, the df, um, depends on your sample size. So here the n would have been 7, um, here the n would have been 3, and you subtract off 1 and you get degrees of freedom of 6, and you subtract off 1 and you get degrees of freedom of 2. Uh, the blue curve is your standard normal curve, or the z. So the blue curve here is the z curve. Um, but then here's a t-curve for 6, um, and here's a t-curve for degrees of freedom of 2. And if we use these curves, um, you notice that the t-curve is still centered at zero, um, but it's wider, it goes out wider, uh, and so t will always be larger than z, um, and it will be even larger depending on the degrees of freedom. So uh, that's the t-curve. It turns out that we can compute t-scores and probability between t-scores in the same way that we did in chapter 6, except the t-curve is not a normal curve. Um, we see that um, back here the blue curve is the standard normal curve, but the t-curve is not the same. It's, it's not. Um, so the t-curve also depends on our degrees of freedom, and so we can compute uh, the probability or area between uh, two t-scores, the minimum t-score and the maximum t-score, um, using this t-CDF, and we can, not everybody has inverse t on their calculator. Um, this is a video that shows you how to program your calculator to get inverse t, if you were interested in that. It is a good bit of work, but it's kind of fun, um, so particularly any computer science majors that are interested in programming um, can watch this video. It's not my video. Uh, I do enjoy programming the calculator, though, so I kind of thought that was some fun to throw in here. But I think if you've checked out a calculator from us,
you will have this calculator function. Um, and then if you have not checked out a calculator, in the video she says that the TI-84s have it and the TI-83s don't or something like that. But I have seen, I've seen all kinds of different things. So I think it kind of depends on the operating system you have on the calculator rather than the calculator number that you have. Um, so, but there are, Every calculator, I've, every TI-83 and 84 I've seen have the TCDF function, um, but there are, I would say, 5 or 10% of the calculators I've seen, um, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe it's as much as a quarter of the calculators I've seen, do not have this inverse T function. But we'll go ahead and, and compute some things. So let's suppose we wanted the probability um, we'll have our t of 0 in the center, we wanted the probability of being between negative 1 and 2.5. Um, and uh, so let's do that um, from negative 1 to 2.5. We would want to use tcdf for probability, and so that the second distr, where our normal cdf would be, um, and we'll use it's option 6 on mine, probably option 6 on yours too. Um, and we want a negative 1, be sure to use the negative, and then 2.5. And then it doesn't ask me for the mean because it knows the mean is 0. The mean of the t curve is always 0. It doesn't ask me for the standard deviation because the standard deviation depends on the degrees of freedom. My degrees of freedom is 28, which means the sample size is 29. Whenever it gives you df, it means it's already subtracted the 1 for you and you don't have to subtract the 1. But if it has said n here, n of 29, then we would have had to subtract 1 to get to the 28. Um, and then uh, we have 82.8% if we wanted to give our answer in percentage terms. 82.8% of our data values would be between a t-score of negative 1 and a t-score of 2.5. Now this one says what is the t-score so if we're wanting to find a t-score we would label it down here on our belt and we'd want to find the value that's below the belt so inverse t. What's our t-score if our degrees of freedom was 6? That means that n would be 7 because they did n minus 1 to get our 6 so uh, we want to use inverse t here so second distr option 4 is inverse t on my calculator. Um, my area um, to the left, if I had 95% in the center, then I would have 5% uh, on both tails, which means I would have 0.025 here and 0.025 here. And so I'm going to do 1 minus 0.025, and then uh, degrees of freedom will be 6. And then I get my t-score of 2.45 if I only wanted three significant digits, um, or um, 2.447 if I wanted more. Uh, and so that's how you can compute t-scores on your calculator, and there's also the t-tables. Uh, so I don't recommend the z-tables, but sometimes using the t-tables is shorter and faster than using uh, specifically if you're only asked to get the t-score, sometimes using the t-tables is faster. Uh, so with the t-tables, just like before, we want to know the degrees of freedom. So keep in mind that your degrees of freedom is always n minus 1. As a matter of fact, on your tables, not the tables that you'll actually use for the final exam, but on your tables, I would maybe even highlight that degree of freedom row and write out there um, that degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1 so that you don't forget when you're using this table to subtract 1 from it. Um, so degrees of freedom, n minus 1. So uh, here, if we had n of 7, that means our degrees of freedom is going to be 6. And so that's the row we want to use. If we have 95%, then we want our 95% in the center and 2.5% on both of the tails. That ends up being a T subscript of 0.025. And you can see all these T subscripts here, um, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, 0 0.1, 0 .1. Um, 0, 0.1, 0 0.005, 0 0 0.001, um, so you can see all the subscripts here, or um, it gives you the nice 95%. Uh, so uh, we'll 
probably need these subscripts more in chapter 9 than we will in this one because it gives us a little cheat here to tell us that the 95% is the T subscript 0.025. Um, but then when we, to use the table, we basically um, find the row that we need and the column that we need. So the row that we need is 6 because that's our degrees of freedom. The column that we need is 95 and where those two overlap is our answer. Uh, and that's exactly what we had on our calculator before, right? Um, is 2.447 if we round it. Um, so the calculator answer gives us the same answer that the tables would give us, but the tables, once you've learned how to use them, uh, are probably a little bit faster in this particular instance than using the calculator. So uh, if you want to use the tables for simple things like this, go ahead. Um, if so another thing to point out on the tables uh, would be that degrees of freedom so if your degrees of freedom is infinity this gives you the z-scores so before remember we calculated the z-scores using inverse norms so we did inverse norm and we drew a picture and we put 95 or 99 percent in the center and if it was 95%, that left 2.5% for each tail. If it was 99%, that only left half of a percent for each of our two tails. Um, and that's how we did inverse norm. 1 minus that right, the area of the right tail, um, and then 0 and 1. Well, we don't actually have to do that. We can just look. Um, so 95% is going to be 1.960, 99% is going to be 2.576, and you may not remember, but that's exactly what we got for both of those. Um, if you happen to be given 98%, um, then you know it's 2.326. Uh, if you're asked for 99.8%, it would be this. If you're asked for 80 or 90%, it would be 1.282 or 1.645. So all of these, um, you can just get off of the t-table the very bottom row because the standard normal curve um, is equal to the t-curve once your degrees of freedom equals infinity. Uh, also, if you had a t-distribution that had a huge sample size, you would just go ahead and use these z-scores. So, um, 80 might not be the very bottom of your tables. You might have 100 or 200 or 400, something like that. Um, but if it is significantly more than the bottom of your tables, like especially if it's twice as much as the very bottom of your tables, go ahead and use the degrees of freedom of infinity instead of the bottom of your tables. Um, if, you know, you'll notice that you start skipping a lot of numbers down here, just use whichever one's closer until you get to the very bottom where it goes to infinity, and then if it's more than twice as much, go ahead and use uh, infinity instead of that last number. And then we can come back to how confident can we be. Well, uh, we can actually use a function that will be so much easier than computing the t-score, looking at the t-score, and uh, doing the x-bar plus or minus uh, the sig uh, z times sigma over the square root of n. Um, so we can actually just do the t-interval function. So let's do that. Uh, here, um, we're given our statistics. Um, we're given sigma, which is the population standard deviation. Um, so sigma is the way of spelling out this symbol of sigma. So since we are given sigma, we want to use the z-interval. Um, so if we know the population standard deviation, we'll, we'll pretend this is s later on, um, but here we really should be using the z-interval. Um, so stat, test, and then z only because the problem told us our population standard deviation. And so z-interval is number 7, and we are given the statistics. We aren't given the 821 data values, thank goodness, because I didn't want to type that many into the calculator. So I'm going to scroll to stats and press enter to select stats. And then it prompts me for sigma. So if you don't know sigma, you shouldn't be in this function. Um, if you know s, s is not sigma. So don't put s in for sigma. So 1.542. Um, our x bar is 9.36. I already had 821, 
um, and sea level, I can do 95 or 0.95, either one. We'll just leave it as 0.95. Um, but I could type 95 in here, and that would give me the same answer. Um, so it will do it as either a decimal or a percentage. Uh, it doesn't matter. And now I know that I can be 95% confident that the interval will be between 9.25 and 9.47. And I think that's very close to what we got when we used an actual 2 instead of um, uh, we're using 1.960 here because we're doing the Z. Now, if this had not been sigma, if this had been S instead of sigma, we would have used the T interval. And so let's do that real quick. Pretend that we had S instead of sigma and use option 8, the T interval. Instead, um, we have still 9.36, and now we're going to... Um, let's use a slightly different number. Let's say we had 1.55 as our S because um, it would not be a perfect estimate of sigma. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and do 95 instead of 0.95. Um, and that will give us almost exactly, if we ran to three significant digits, almost exactly what we had before. Probably because we have such an enormous sample size. Remember that um, the degrees of freedom here would be 820 because our n is 821 uh, and the once that sample size gets uh, that huge it's almost the z curve um, because as degrees of freedom get closer and closer to infinity uh, it would be the z curve as a matter of fact if you're using the t tables you might even be forced to use 1.960 um, because it's so huge on the 821 it may not give you a better number than the 1.960 uh, and so that's how we do uh, interval estimates for means. There are a couple of other topics that we want to talk about, though, um, particularly why we're allowed to do this. Um, and we're not allowed to do this if these two things aren't true. So the first thing that we need to be true is that we have a simple random sample. So all the way back in Chapter one, we talked about what it meant to have a simple random sample. And recall that we had to have a list of the entire population distribution, the whole thing. Um, so here we are dealing with the um, only people who have had coronavirus in the U.S. So hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people would be in our list. And of course, there's no way unless we're the CDC. And even then, I'm not sure if they have a comprehensive list of every person who's been diagnosed with coronavirus. They might. Not sure. Um, but we would need to have that list, and we would need to number that list, and then we would need to use a random number generator to choose our 821 to be part of our sample in order for it to qualify as a simple random sample. So you begin to understand the problem of how hard that first assumption is. And I, I would say that um, all of these studies that are per published in these prestigious journals, I would say most of them probably don't meet the first assumption. Uh, and if the first assumption isn't true, then the whole thing isn't true. It kind of just falls apart. Uh, so, yeah, I guess statistics are a very bad name. Um, so we say that we're 95% certain. Take that with a huge grain of salt. Unless you go and you verify by reading the study that it really did have a simple random sample. They really did have the entire population and numbered the population and used a random number generator to determine who was going to be part of their study. If they did that, then kudos to them, uh, and they would actually be legit, and you could have good confidence in the results of that study. And then there is a second assumption, not quite as hard to obtain as that first elusive assumption, uh, and that is that you're supposed to have a normal population distribution. Now, we say normal population distribution, and that is the official, um, but what we're really talking about is, of course, the sampling distribution. So always look at your distribution to see if it's crazy because if it, it really has extreme skewness or extreme outliers then we may not be allowed to do this. Um, but remember in the previous chapter that the central limit theorem said that if we had at least 30 data values unless it was crazy, unless it was crazy skewed or crazy outliers um, then we were good to go. So uh, most of the time um, if you don't have the data and you have at least 30 data values, I would say go ahead and waive it. But if you have the data values, you should absolutely look at the histogram of those data values 
before you proceed to make sure there aren't crazy outliers or extreme skewness. Um, but as long as, as long, I mean, this one's almost perfect as it is. Um, and certainly, but if you had 30 data values, you would be good to go. Um, so uh, you want a simple random sample and a normal population distribution before you do these confidence intervals. And then the very last thing in this huge section that's only part of, or the half of chapter eight, the half with the means instead of proportions, um, the very last thing that we'll do is talk about the sample size. Now keep in mind that the sample size is really something we would compute at the very beginning, back in chapter one, before we did anything, we would compute what sample size we would need for our data. So uh, before we go out and collect the information, we would think about what our confidence level is, and that will determine our Z, um, what our room for error is, and that will determine our margin of error. And so we would think about what we want for these things as a researcher. Um, so what's our, our level of confidence and what's the maximum error that we want in our results? And then we would compute the sample size. Um, but we didn't really know what margin of error was, and we didn't really know what confidence levels were back in chapter one, and so that's why we didn't study them in chapter one. Uh, and the margin of error formula, remember the margin of error formula is um, the z-score times the standard error, and the standard error is sigma divided by the square root of n, so um, z-score times sigma divided by the square root of m. And so if we were to manipulate this formula and solve for n, or n here, um, then what we would need to do is divide the margin of error by z, and then divide the margin of error by sigma, so we'd have z and sigma in the denominator and margin of error in the numerator. Um, and then we would need to square both sides, so we would have margin of error squared z squared a margin of error squared in the numerator and z and sigma squared in the denominator. And then we would um, need to flip it because n is in the denominator, so we'd need to flip this and we'd need to flip this. And when we do all of that, we'd actually get exactly this formula. So basically, uh, you don't need to know how to do all of that, but just know that this, if you solve for n from the margin of error formula, you get this formula. So this formula comes straight from the margin of error formula. Um, if we had decided on a 95% confidence interval, we would use a z-score of 1.960, um, and then we we just kind of go ahead and set what we want our margin of error to be. Um, now, in all of this, we're doing all of this because we want to estimate the population mean mu. Um, and if we had the entire population's worth of data, there would be no need to estimate the population mean mu, we would just compute it. Um, and so we really don't know sigma. Um, and we even don't know s because we haven't gathered our sample yet. So we don't have our sample to compute s because we haven't gathered our sample. So we don't know sigma and we don't know s. So what will we do? Um, well, we have this kind of crazy idea, um, but it's all that we can do, and it comes from the empirical rule. So in the empirical rule, we know that all or nearly all of our data is going to be within three standard deviations of the mean. Um, that's three standard deviations on this side and three standard deviations on this side. So that's a total of six standard deviations. And that's going to equal all or nearly all of our data. So we'll call that the range. Um, so uh, the range of our data should be approximately six standard deviations. So if we wanted, and I guess I should put a wavy line here, that's how mathematicians, a little tilde, um, that's how mathematicians denote uh, the approximately equal to. So our standard deviation would be approximately equal to the range divided by six. Um, and so that's what we'll do. Uh, we will suppose that we're gathering data for coronavirus patients and the number of days that they are sick. Um, I actually happen to know someone who um, was sick. She's probably even outside of the six standard deviations, um, but we'll go ahead and use her. She was sick like a dog <laughs> for six months. Um, at least. She may have even been sicker longer than that, but I think that's enough of an outlier. Um, we'll go ahead and just say six months. 
Um, and really, I'm just going to estimate it with 180 days because I know that's uh, very nicely divisible by 6. I think it's really supposed to be 182.5 or, you know, if you throw the quarter in, it, it can be, get complicated. But we'll just go ahead and say she was sick 180 days um, and we'll do the crude estimate of the range divided by 6 um, because we'll assume that the shortest would be sick 0 days. Um, that they might not have been sick at all. Uh, they just got accidentally diagnosed. And I know somebody like that, too, who never, um, she never would have known that she had coronavirus if she weren't in the hospital for a completely different reason and required to take the coronavirus test. Um, so 30 is what we're going to use. And that's really large. Um, so we're probably going to get a very large sample size. So we will say our standard deviation is 30 even though our average was, what, 9.36? Our standard deviation is 30 days. Um, and uh, so we'll use that. And then we're going to go with a 1.960 because we're going to say we want to be 95% confident. That's pretty standard. You'll see that a lot. You'll have 1.960 memorized by the time you get done with this chapter easily because you will see that so much. Um, and the margin of error, let's say I want my my mean to be very precise. I want at most a quarter of a day error on the mean, the average number of days six. So um, a quarter of a day. Uh, and this number for proportions is always going to be between zero and one because proportions are always between zero and one. But for means, it really can be anything that your um, data value is, but it is the maximum error that you want in your data value. So it can be more than one um, it would be a positive number for sure, um, but it can be more than one. Uh, if, if, for instance, we were okay with a two-day margin of error, um, which would be huge, uh, but uh, if we were okay with that, then we could have made our margin of error be two here. And then we don't don't forget that we want to round up always. So. Um, Ooh, we have a sample size of 55,320 because we have to round up. Um, of course, when you're talking with 55,000, the 20 or 19 is not going to make a big difference. Wow. Um, I'm sure that's because uh, I'm using what's probably most certainly an outlier here um, and that the real standard deviation is probably much smaller than 30. Um, but... Uh, that that's what I knew and what I got. So if you take the range and divide it by six, you may get something that's enormous, way more than you need. Um, hopefully you won't. Um, I think the variability in coronavirus is far more uh, than than anything else we've seen. Um, and certainly my friend who's been sick six months, um, she's far worse than than typical as well. Uh, so, but yeah, that's how we would do the sample size. And uh, then that pretty much wraps up the confidence interval section for means. As you go through your discussions, your homework, your projects, your quizzes, don't forget to use your formula card, especially the T interval and the Z interval because they will save you a whole bunch of time rather than using the formula. Uh, don't forget to use these lecture notes printed out with the notes on top of them. And of course, don't forget to use your, your T tables. It um, will be helpful in several instances. Your textbook and Newton instruction will be enormously helpful as far as definitions and ideas and concepts go. Um, they may tell you the long way to do things, though. Um, the short way is the calculator, T interval, and Z interval functions. Um, and not only is it going to save you um, like half, half the time or even more in doing the homework, um, but the T interval and the Z interval functions on the calculator are more likely to give you the correct answer because there are all kinds of ways that you can make a mistake if you were doing these uh, intervals by hand. Uh, so you could make a mistake in looking at the t-score. You could not do the right degrees of freedom. Um, you could not do the right column. You can make a mistake in doing x bar plus or minus um, whatever your t-score is times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. You can make a mistake on any one of those um, or maybe even the way you've typed it into the calculator um, and any of those could give you a mistake. Uh, so 
again, my preference certainly is to use the t-interval function and the z-interval function because that will be faster um, and uh, always give you the correct answer as long as you've typed in the right information and use the correct function. Remember, t is for when we don't know the population standard deviation and z is for when we do know, when we have been given the population standard deviation sigma. If all of that fails, please, please, please message me. Chapter 8 is the chapter to do it if you're ever going to do it. Um, and chapter 9, chapters 8 and 9 are, are pretty tough. So send me a screenshot of the question that you're working on and uh, we'll text you back. And I wish you the very best of luck. Um, I'm rooting for you in this chapter.